Hello, everyone. Welcome to Data Art Conversations with Sports Betting Industry Leaders. Uh, this is Episode 7, uh, titled Sports Integrity, Playing by the Rules. Today, we're uh, joined by Matthew Holt, CEO of U.S. Integrity. And as always, I'm joined by Matthew Schatz and Kevin Twitchell, advisors here at Data Art. So we'll just jump right into it. Um, Matt, thank you for joining us and giving us some of your time today. Um, please tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, U.S. Integrity. Uh, thanks, Russell. Pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, so I used to work at a company called Canner Gaming, and uh, we launched the first regulated mobile sports betting app in the United States. Um, you know, at a time when, you know, people didn't even think it would be successful. You know, my former CEO, Liam Adis, there was so ahead of the curve. I remember walking into the M Casino with him to launch the first regulated mobile sports betting app. And they told him, well, I have to put a number down. How much handle do you think you'll do at this thing? Five, $10 million this year. And and he's like started swearing. And what are you effing crazy? We're going to do $100 million this year. And uh, so the guy goes, well, I'll put down 15. And we did $450 million a handle off the mobile app in the first year. And uh, I think it completely woke up the industry because everyone thought, oh, yeah, you'll be able to bet on your phones eventually. And this wasn't something new. I mean, this was being done all over the world already, whether illegally and illegally. And um, we just said, why don't we do it here? I mean, there's plenty of ways to verify identity and age now and geolocation. And um, and that was the first mobile sports betting app in the United States here in Las Vegas. And um, working so closely over there, I also was the CEO, COO of their sister company, CG Analytics, which is a licensed information service provider where we provided game integrity, fraud prevention, and odds creation services. And I was working with the NBA, NHL, NCAA, NFL, basically everybody, fairly rudimentary, consult, consultative uh, style, uh, you know, game integrity services. They'd give us, you know, tips. They might have got, we'd look into the betting on them. We would, when we saw abnormal, abnormal wagering, we'd fire back at them. And um, working so closely with all the leagues, I knew that PASPO was going to be repealed and, and Q2 of 2018. And that there was going to be a need for truly independent, conflict-free data and technology-driven game integrity, fraud prevention, and sports betting compliance services. And you know, a few of the early adopter states, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Mississippi, actually had integrity mandates in their reg language. And I was so surprised that even with a regulatory mandate in this gold rush of regulated sports betting, everybody still wanted to make bets, take bets, build a platform or be an affiliate marketer. And, and I said, well, I mean, if there's a mandate and everybody has to do it, I'll build a compliance firm. I know it's not sexy, but uh, we built U.S. Integrity and now we work with almost every single regulated sports book in the country, regulators in 32 states. Uh, the NBA, uh, you know, the SEC, the Pac-12, the Big 12, most of the major professional and collegiate sports leagues. And, you know, we're pretty excited about our positioning in the industry and, um, you know, where we can take it from here. Yeah, well, <clears throat> that's really interesting. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so it's, it sounds like, you know, you handle a lot of data that's, um, you know, extremely uh, uh uh, you know, this should be handled securely. Um, and, uh, you know, the leagues that you mentioned, the casinos, they have a lot of trust in you that whatever they pass along, um, you know, they're more or less confidential will remain that way. So, you know, how do you get around the challenge of making sure that the data that you do take in is handled securely? And when you do have to share it, that's also done securely. I would say the the secure sharing is just as difficult as the process of ingesting data. The great thing about ingesting all this data and information is you kind of get to dictate or at least know how it's all coming in. Uh, where it gets trickier is who has access to each individual piece of information when an investigation starts. And, and sometimes those lines aren't so clear, right? Well, uh, we're investigating this NBA game and these certain bets made by these certain people on this certain market. So we have to let the operators in that particular state know, the regulators in that particular state 
But does the league have an obligation to know? Yes. But what can you share back with the league? Well, I mean, the individual books don't want their wagers shared necessarily back. So there's certainly some sensitivities to all that. And, um, you know, so far, so good. We always say the most important number to us at U.S. Integrity Zero, the number of clients we've ever lost at U.S. Integrity. And, and we understand that the day we start messing up data or break that confidentiality or lose the trust of our clients, it's going to be a mass exodus. So we put a lot of thought and care into how we handle data, who has access to that data, and how that data is shared. Yeah. And, and, and is there any... So is there any difference, Matt, if you notice an irregularity on your end, so you're kind of outbound telling somebody else that this is something you're looking into versus you got an inbound request to go look at a situation? Does the data process and who has access around that change, whether it's inbound versus outbound? It does. But most of the so how the system works really is we pull in all this data, real bets being placed in the U.S. We're the only company that actually gets real betting data in the United States. So we ingest all of this amazing data, along with statistical and event data, and then our system flags for abnormality. So naturally, you know, 95 percent of the alerts are completely outbound anyway, because our system flagged something, an analyst looked into it, it elevated to a critical enough level where there's an alert sent out. Um, very rarely is it at the opposite. We do get the opposite. And normally it's something like, hey, this player is going to be suspended or this player is going to be out or this player is not going to be on the team and nobody knows yet. We want to make sure that nobody's leaking or selling that information ahead of time. And then we'll pull that information in, look, and then send stuff back to them. But I would say the vast majority of alerts we send out are flagged by our system. An analyst looked into it and, and the alert level raised high enough to send something out. You know, going to, to the data that you're getting, <clears throat> the volume must be increasing, you know, at such a level right now. How is your system? There's two things in this question. Are the operators very protective in giving you the data? Who ultimately owns that data? Are there are there some that are more restrictive um, on providing it to you and where it goes after it leaves your hands? And then with the volumes coming in, you know, systemically, what are you looking at? you know, for this year and next year is, is to deal with that type of volume of data. Huge amounts of data coming in. One of the challenges with the data, first of all, is that it never comes in in standardized formats. No matter how easy we try to make it to just you know, be a simple API in and out, it's never that easy. And so many of these platforms that are coming over from Europe weren't necessarily meant to share data because they never did before. There was very loose. Let's I think loose is even a loose word here. Right. We'll just call them very loose integrity regulations throughout the rest of the world prior to the U.S. Um, you know, sort of legalizing across the country in May of 2018. And these platforms weren't really built to share data for the purposes that we do. So a lot of times we get it in all kinds of formats, including some states where who mandate the operator share data with us, but they don't mandate in real time. It says within a reasonable amount of time. So at like two, three, four in the morning, we'll get these huge data dumps where it's all the bets for the last 24 hours and our system parses them out. So the next morning, regulators come in, compliance folks at the operators come in, our analysts can go back and review, but we're not necessarily catching anything in real time. And the, and the way that data comes in usually leads a, needs a lot of finessing in order to get it to a usable format. So... Sometimes it's just the way that we're ingesting the data, being able to clean that data first, you know, and even just make it usable. Um, there's certainly a lot of challenges. And then, there, of course, there's the PI stuff. So we don't pull in any personal information. So in many right. cases, operators will give us account ID. So we, we know that, you know, there is a better ABC123 out there, but we don't know the name of ABC123. And we intentionally do that because we don't want to store that type of data. The second you do your cybersecurity risk and insurances go through the roof. Rather, if we notice that account ABC123 is participating in what we would consider a suspicious activity, we can notify that operator and notify a regulator simultaneously and they can look into it. 
And if we end up needing to know the name for an investigation on a one-off basis, fine. Uh, but overall, we try not to handle any PI as well, because that's really where data gets problematic. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, well, you, you discussed, like, you just mentioned, like, one of your uh, bigger bigger challenges. Um, like, what other uh, kind of potential, uh, you know, hurdles do you have to kind of, you know, jump over on a daily basis? Number one is inconsistencies amongst regs. You know, everybody thinks of the United States as a 50 state, 50 set of rules problem, but in actually it's a 260 jurisdiction, 260 sets of rules problem when you start to include all the sovereign nations, which are the tribal reservations. And each of those tribal reservations have their own compact, their own rules, their own regulations. So it's unbelievable the amount of regs we have to try to keep up with. Not all of them are the same. And in a lot of cases, some of the operators are great. They just say, hey, look, we believe in integrity. We believe in what you're doing, U.S. integrity. Here's our data everywhere. Some of them only give us data when it's mandated. So if it's not mandated, we're not getting the data. Or if it's not mandated in real time, we're getting it in data dumps overnight. Mm -hmm. But we're trying to identify and flag abnormalities in real time. But doing it without all the data presents its own set of challenges. And, you know, the first time that there's a big betting scandal that we don't catch, people are going to go, oh, my gosh, how, do you, how did you not catch that? Well, we probably would have caught it if we would have had all the data, right? And so that's the end of it is we never thought we'd be lobbyists trying to lobby legislators to put these data mandates in place, but they're just so important. And if we don't, then it's hard to get, it's much harder to get legislature changed or uh, any type of bills changed than it just is to include it in the first place. So we try to fight hard to, hey, you're going to want this yourself. You can't protect your own constituents if you don't. Um, and trying to get these things in place right out of the gate. And, you know, that's been one of the major challenges. And then sometimes it's participation from the leagues. Um, there's some different areas and some different rules that are really challenging to get, you know, to probably regulate and accomplish. One of the interesting ones in many states is what they call excluded betters list or exclusion list, which basically say if you're a baseball player, you can't bet on baseball, period. Okay, that actually makes sense. Good rule, right? Makes sense why we'd have it. Makes sense why everybody would need it. But the problem with that rule is how do you get the list of who's on a baseball team? <laughs> so college football players can't bet on college sports. Great, makes sense to me. How do I get a list of who's on who's on that 83-man roster of all 130 D1 yeah. football teams <laughs> and then another 100-plus <laughs> FCS teams? And the schools don't want to share it with you for player privacy reasons. And then the professional leagues don't want to share it because it's in their contracts with the player unions that they don't have to share it. So if you try to do it off publicly available information, the lists are actually too fluid. Players change sports, coaches come in and out, trainers are constantly in and out. You can't get enough information or who's going to pay to maintain it, right? Who's going to actually maintain this list? Operators don't want to pay an arm and a leg to get it. Um, that's been an interesting challenge where there's these state rules in place that say, hey, you can't bet. And if you bet the operator, you're also going to be in trouble for taking those bets. But how do I know that that guy walking in the room is the starting point guard of the University of Colorado? How do I have any idea? Um, it's a challenge. Those are some of the interesting challenges we're trying to solve right now. Yeah, I think, I think with you know, sports betting expanding the way it is, um, you know, that's going to be something that we will be critical to address, you know, yes. maybe not that far down the road. And as you mentioned, you know, the getting legislation uh, passed to, um, to mandate these things, um, you know, are, are difficult now, but hmm. with more bets out there, there's potential for more occurrences of these suspicious activities. And maybe once, you know, a big operator learns their lesson, you know, they might kind of, you know, change their tune a little bit. <laughs> yeah. At the end of the day, I think sports betting has expanded legal regulated sports betting has expanded faster than even the most optimistic people would have thought since the repeal of PASPA and the betting handle numbers are higher than even the most optimistic people would have thought. It's just been unbelievable. I remember having all, you know, all these discussions in 2017 and early 2018 when we knew PASPA would be repealed and 
people were saying, well, maybe we get to like five or six states in the first like three to five years. Well, we're only just over three years in now and we're 32 states. I mean, just unbelievable how fast it's gone. And COVID did nothing but expedite it even more as states became more and more, you know, uh, in need of the extra revenue. And, you know, uh, just amazing. We're at 32 states. We'll certainly be at 40 by the end of 2022. And, um, you know, people were saying it would take decades to get there. And in four years, we'll basically be at 40 states. Yeah, and some states will will never have it, right? That's right. I think 44, 45 is probably the limit anyway. Hawaii, Utah, Alaska, ever, ever go. Alabama, South Carolina, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. yeah. Fascinating watching New York here, having a front row seat watching the now this consortium <clears throat> that just got through in New York. Um, yeah. For the mobile on the mobile side which is going to make it interesting. And if they flip that switch by Super Bowl, which they want, um, that's going to add a whole a whole bunch of new complexities, I'm sure, in the on the data side and for you as well. New York, what was interesting about New York is, so we're so used to the same five to seven people getting licensed right out of the gate in every state, right? right. FanDuel, DraftKings, MGM, Caesars, PointsBet, and right. you know, Rush Street Interactive and Barstool. Well, what really made news today in New York wasn't who got licensed because yeah. it was the same old people we expected to see. It was who didn't get licensed. And that was Barstool Sports and Penn National, who I think for the first time in the legalized sports betting era took it on the chin today. And Jay-Z. Don't forget Jay-Z. Jay-Z was oh, and Jay-Z. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Excellent. Um, so well, let's kind of shift topics here. Uh Several weeks ago, you know, Kevin and I were at a GTE and we saw you on a, on a panel. And uh, one of the topics that you discussed that was very interesting, you know, for me uh, was uh, the concept of house rules, which, you know, I really didn't think about it as it, it being uh, kind of a, uh, a subject worth discussing because I think most betters are not even aware of them. Um, can, can, you, can you talk about kind of the, uh, what house rules are? and then some of the variations between operators? Sure, so house rules dictate how a sports book handles a wide variety of situations. Like how long must a football game go for there to be action? It's 55 minutes of the 60 minutes played. And, you know, we actually had a game here once, a bowl game with Wisconsin and UNLV, where Wisconsin was just throttling UNLV and was essentially a pick em, and a mysterious van smashed into the transformer outside and they had only played 52 minutes and all the bets were null and void and the situation <laughs> where it was going to cost the sports books out here millions and millions of dollars. Uh, wow. The lights went out. You know, Wisconsin was up by 40. They just said that's it, but they had only played 52 minutes. But there's all kinds of things that come up in sports. Osaka withdraws from the French Open due to anxiety. Some books offer refunds. Some say it's a loser. The Kentucky Derby horse gets disqualified for steroids after. But most books have already paid. And, you know, do you pay the second place horse now? Do people get their money back? So there's these wide range of things that just happen in sports. Rain out in, in baseball, which happen all the time, you know, almost daily. You get somebody gets rained out on an MLB game, and, and those house rules dictate how the sports books handle these things. And sometimes they are very controversial, and the sports books house rules don't always mimic each other across the board. So you can go to 10 different books and make the exact same bet and get several different results, some wins, some ties, some losses. And that can leave customers confused, upset, um, not wondering, you know, what happened. And, um, you know, we had a good example this year where one of the um, hosts of a show on VEASAN made a $1,000 bet on the young lady who won the French Open last year during COVID, won it in 2020. And the event, which is normally, what, in the late spring or early spring, got yeah. pushed due to COVID. <laughs> and because the event moved and, it, it, you know, the original, all the bets on the original were null and void. And when they decided to rehab, you know, open the French Open, it's going to be in November instead of, you know, whatever, April this year. Um, you know, they, they 
voided all the old bets and put up new odds on the as if it was an entirely new event. And one of those hosts had a thousand dollars to win on the young lady that had inevitably won it at 30 to one. And all he got was his money back because essentially they said, hey, we canceled all those original med bets made way back yeah. and treated it as a new event because they played it six months later and things had changed. Mm-hmm. And really, when they canceled it, they didn't even know if there ever would be a French Open that year. But we know it didn't play, take place on the dates it said it would. So we canceled it, voided all those bets and set up new odds. And he was really upset and thought that, hey, they didn't do a good enough job of displaying that information or notifying customers of that. And he took it to the gaming control board and lost to the sports book one. Um, because at the end of the day, they do post house rules, whether it's on the betting app where they're available or inside the actual physical sports book somewhere. But I will say this, they're rarely displayed prominently. How many ask your normal buddy who just went to make a bet at a book, who's not a, you know, bet every day for a living, Say, hey, did you see the house rules? Hey, you went in there to make a bet. Did you see that? He's going to say no. And nobody ever notices them. Nobody looks for them. There's not a big sign anywhere that says house rules here. Um, And because of that, most people actually don't know what they are. And it causes a lot of confusion and mayhem. And one of the things we deal with constantly is people calling us saying, hey, this happened in this game. DraftKings gave me a refund. And draft and FanDuel gave me a refund. So the game must be fixed because FanDuel and DraftKings gave me my money back because it is. But William Hill and Caesars and MGM said that it's a loser. What's going on? You need to go after them. It's an integrity issue. And we always tell them the same thing, sir, ma'am. DraftKings and FanDuel didn't say that the game is fixed. They gave you your money back following their own house rules. These other sports books are following their house rules. And they may have differed. Did you check the house rules? Well, what's a house rule and where do you find them? <laughs> and look, it's it's a difficult situation. And it's one of those things where you say, well, how often does this come up? Almost daily. There's almost something that happens in sports at least once a week that where the house rules come into a question. Yet it's amazing that 99% of people who place a bet have no idea that it even exists, never mind where to find it or ever seen it. Do you think there's potential to kind of standardize house rules across the entire industry or there are too many? No, I think there is. And I think that you need to have really strict enforcement both ways on the sports books that don't. So what we have seen in the past year is some of the newer sports books using um, using it as a way to as a marketing tool. So, you know, hey, something happens, you know, the. Uh, you know, the Kentucky Derby horse. Well, they didn't disqualify that horse till the next day. You pay out those bets three minutes after the race is over. What are you supposed to do the next day? I mean, there's you already paid out all the people who won on those bets today. Yeah. Some books go ahead and start paying them anyway. And what happens is the sports books start picking and choosing. Well, this one we didn't take a lot of action on, so we'll just pay all the losers, send a couple of tweets, and tell our customers how much we appreciate them. But when you don't do it consistently, it just leads to more customer confusion. And so I think at the end of the day, house rules should be clear. They should be concise. And then they should be forced. The operator should be forced to follow them to a T. Yeah. Makes sense. Great. It's amazing. The the human element that still exists. In all this, we're talking about technology, we're talking about huge data banks and data things, but at the end of the day, it's some guy making some house rules, and then, you know, you may be being on the phone with people. So there's still, I still think we're still in the early days, some primitive days here. And despite the fact that they make all these house rules, at least once a month, something something happens in sports that people don't know how to handle. Like, right. oh, we never thought a, a tornado would rip the roof off the stadium. Now what do we do? Or it's, it's always right, right. something, right? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, COVID gave us a whole new set of challenges and yeah. and how we handle things. And you know, games voided or moved locations due to COVID. And um, there's just so many things to consider now that can happen within an event. Changing venues, changing times, changing days. They're getting canceled. You know, uh, calling the games halfway through the games. Um, you know, think of the amount of exhibition games. There's no other country in the world 
that allows the amount of wagering that the United States does on exhibition games, NBA All-Star game, MLB All-Star game, NFL preseason, where the participants in those games will tell you they don't care if they win. They're literally, you know, an NFL preseason, you're just trying to get your backup quarterback familiar with the playbook or, you know, in Major League Baseball spring training, you're just trying to get your team and roster built out. And NBA preseason is just about getting back in shape, not who wins or loses these games. Yet we bet millions of dollars on them. It's it's, it's amazing how uh, sports wagering has just become so entrenched in our daily life in America right now. And it's so interesting that people think of U.S. integrity for some of the getting back to the House rules for a minute. Like it's not to me obvious or maybe even intuitive that people would think that's an integrity issue. But but there it is. And they they go there. Kind of interesting. What about a case uh, like, let's say, where there are some people in the world that might know the outcome. And I'm thinking of two different examples in the sports world, let's say the length of the national anthem for the Super Bowl prop being an obvious one where somebody who's there at the rehearsal might know whether it's going to clear 215 or Academy Award winners in a, in a non-sports realm. Does, does U.S. integrity get involved in those situations or that's really just the accounting firms protecting their data? No, we try to. So thankfully, um, a lot of states don't allow you to bet on the time of the national anthem still. That's always been a big, very popular bet with the illegal bookies. A lot of actual regulated sports books don't allow it because the result is known and so easily manipulated. Maybe it takes you 218 in rehearsal four days in a row and you intentionally you know, make the land of the brave last an extra six seconds and bang, there you go. And the thing flies over. Um, but but it's the, the things that we do allow wagering on is getting bigger and bigger in the United States, including, you know, where will this coach that just got fired coach next? Who will be the next head coach at LSU or things that, again, the people that are going to make these decisions. All right. So who's going to be the next head coach at LSU? Here's 30 guys. Let's give them all odds. Isn't this fun? But at the end of the day, there's actual human beings who get to make that decision. How do we know they didn't go bet 20,000 on a hundred to one shot and then hire that guy or, or look what the odds are before they hire them. And um, I'm, I'm blown away that just three and a half years in, we've got so far ahead of where anyone ever thought we'd be in 20 I mean, we're taking bets now. I saw Colorado just passed recently in the last couple of months. Next play, runner pass. So all a college quarterback has to do is walk up to the line, give the signal to the betters, touch his helmet, touch his shoulder, (laughs) rub his shirt, whatever it is, two fingers up in the air. That means, hey, we're going to run the ball. You audible out of a pass play, you run the ball, who cares? Boom, up to the next play. And, and now you give your, your followers five or six sure things, not just one sure thing. Hey, bet on us. Don't worry, we won't cover the spread. Five, six, 10, 15 sure things per game to bet on. Just so hard now to suddenly track these things in real time and, and identify what's actually fishy and what's not. That's why I think what you're doing with the colleges, you know, when we were actually had the chance to visit you in person, which was great and great to meet your team. It was fascinating hearing your you on the, the phone with the SEC, you know, in real again, in real time talking about this past weekend. I think the tempt at college, you know, with all these kids, 80 kids that have never seen money before, you know, it's that, that level of integrity has got to be huge because there's so many temps out there right now, not only for them now getting branding dollars, but what you just said, how can they even fix a game with something like that? And at the end of the day, what a lot of people don't realize is if you go back and look at all the major scandals and college basketball as the most in the United States, whether it's Toledo, Northwestern, Arizona state, San Diego, what do they all have in common? The perpetrators in those, in those scandals were making like $3,000 or less per game. I mean, this isn't multi-million dollar schemes. Right. Look, the Toledo running back fumbled twice in a bowl game, not a regular season game, their championship bowl game for $1,200. The Northwestern point guard admitted to taking $1,000. This isn't right. millions of dollars. It's, it's some kid who got himself in a bind and doesn't know how to get out by beside. This is the only way they think they can get out. That's me. <clears throat> 
Um, so let's talk about uh, you know some of the innovations in the industry um, before we wrap up here. So um, what have you, I guess, seen over the past uh, maybe like 12 months uh, and what do you see kind of ahead for, for, for the industry? I, the biggest thing I think I've seen in the last 12 months, and I don't think it's a hundred percent solved is the latency issue, which also results in the customer experience around in-play betting. So for years, the problem with in-play betting was always that the, the time difference between what was actually happening on the field and what was happening uh, on your TV was too great. You know, it'd be like 45 seconds apart, a minute apart. But in order to have in-play betting, the sports books would have to buy the live feed from the stadiums. So the sports books would be ahead of the TV. So you're watching a game and you go to make a bet and you're like, wow, why do the odds say that? Oh, you would know. Watch, he's going to throw a touchdown pass or, hey, I bet the Celtics make this next three or, hey, I bet the Red Sox hit a home run this at bat because you could <laughs> tell by the odds what was going to happen. Yeah. And it made for a really bad customer experience. And then because the TV wasn't synced with your odds or it was so far off, you would look for breaks in the action to go make a bet. But you weren't even anywhere near aligned to what was what was really happening. So you'd go to make a bet and it would say odds change. Try again. So you'd re-log in and go to do it again. Well, you would try and fail seven or eight times and finally say, forget this, in-play betting sucks. I don't want to even do it. It was such a poor customer experience. And that's why people always pointed to you know Europe and said, wow, almost 70% of the bets there are placed in play. Yeah, and 1.5% of the bets are in the America were placed in play. And it wasn't that Americans hated in play or that the sports aren't any good for it. It's just it was such a poor customer experience. And we've seen those in-play betting numbers that literally were 2%, you know, 18 months ago are almost 10% of the marketplace now. And 10% may not seem like a lot when you're comparing it to Europe, but it's five times greater than it was just 18 months prior. I think the industry through technology has done such an amazing job of making that a fun and positive customer experience that it's supposed to be instead of the really frustrating it was well, the frustrating one it was for so long. That's and is that because I think that certain companies have come along and have, have improved the speed at which they can transmit the data or what's driving that experience getting better? A lot of it. A, the data is transmitted much faster. Even TV broadcast period can go. That latency that they need for things is much lower than it's ever been through the use of technology. And then the sports books compensated a little bit on their end. You go to make a bet in play. And you never type that bet and hit submit. And it just automatically goes through. It always spins for a few seconds. So they said, all right, well, if the TV people can get us down to a seven second delay, and we can make that thing spin for six seconds. Now we're only two seconds different. Seems like we're almost real time. So both sides sort of met in the middle a little bit. And, and here we go. Now we have a product that's a much better user experience. Much more frequency of the bets getting through. A much better sync with the actual experience the viewer is having. Thus, not surprisingly, we're seeing a lot more bets getting placed in play. Yeah, you know, it's funny you say that because I think that's what got... Russell and the Dadar team so excited about this, the U.S. market for sports betting, you know, because what we saw in being the tech partner for Betfair overseas and what's coming here in the U.S., we knew there'd be a lot of people that are going to be really struggling with this issue. And and the the smart folks at Data Art, they're the ones that really can figure these out. Um, that's why we're so passionate about being in this business, actually. Um well, that's just our little plug for day <laughs> uh, You have to put that commercial in. That, that's what uh, you know. Right. And, that's what um, I always. Have I to was wondering where that was going, but now that you just came a, out and I said have it was to put an that ad, in, no clean, I, I always do that. I have to do it at some point. But um, but this has been great because I, if I hadn't done it, we couldn't wrap it up. Um, but you know, you didn't mention in your intro, which I found most fascinating, going to your office. What a great Boston sports fan you are. And I can wow, see I some of it behind that. because your office is like a museum for a, for a Boston sports fan with all your little statuettes. And um, so, so as far as sports betting, you know, what is, uh, what are the Patriots going to do? What's, what are the odds now? 
Look, they're coming down. The I mean, look, three weeks ago they were, you know, probably 200 to one a lot of places. But what we've seen is, and look, they had a couple of tough losses, the tough loss to Tampa, a tough loss to Dallas. They could have won either of those games. Yeah. But the fact that they played them both tough and then have turned around and won three straight and now Buffalo losing to Jacksonville. I mean, the Jets in Miami are done. And with Buffalo losing, I, and again, the Patriots winning yet again on the road at Carolina, I think there's new life. And I think what you're going to see is because history has been on the side of Coach B and the Pats for so long is that there might even be too much optimism in the Patriots' chances uh-huh. to come back with a rookie quarterback right now. I won't get it's myself started on the fact that uh, Buffalo cost me my suicide pool yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Just blame Josh Allen. I did. Yeah, both of them. <laughs> well, it's been great. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this has been uh, great. Uh, thanks again, uh, Matt, for you know, joining us here. I really appreciate all the insight and uh, information about U.S. integrity and everything you share with us about the industry in general as well. Yeah, thank you, guys. It was a real pleasure.